Hirosha Shipe here with another episode of Satoshi Treasure Hunters. On this episode, a special edition episode, I will be talking about Text Adventure Games. In particular, I'll be talking about its influence on the Satoshi Treasure Hunt. We're going to cover the history of uh, modern computers, the history of Text Adventure Games, what a Text Adventure Game is, the game mechanics, some popular text adventure games, and most importantly, how text adventure games have influenced the Satoshi Treasure Hunt. So let's begin. Computers, depending on how you view history, can go back to as early as the Sumerian Aspis, and was thought to have been invented in Babylon around 2700 to 2300 common era or you can go as early as the punch card moon calculator but for the purpose of our discussion we'll talk about the dawn of the modern computers in the 70s the clunky boxy can hit with a car cost as much of a car or a house and keep on ticking noisy loud as screens can make people cry now looking at the interface and a primary use case for business governments and university and functioning with an internet and not an internet. These caveman-like devices were bringing about the change of everything and just about everything. And many of the very things we use today started in the beginning of this modern age. I'm not going to list all of them, but mostly focus on the one thing that we came here to discuss, and that is gaming. In particular, the text adventure games the OG of computer games, built upon mechanics created out of necessity, inspired by role-playing games and novels of the 70s. These games lasting from the 70s to early 90s until graphics became a thing, and thus the console ended up taking over gaming. PC masters will say different, but truth is truth. But what is a text adventure game? Often referred to now as interactive fiction, is very much as the descriptor states, a game based on text, and we'll get to why that's the format, is very much written in the style of novels or based on existing novel formats. A choose your own adventure style narrative based in a fictional world, the genre of the world in which everyone would play in was very much adventure heavy centric. So a lot of fantasy games were part of the initial wave of text adventure game. The game player would have to enter simple word-based commands, some predetermined word usage in the game, and we'll talk about those commands uh, when we talk about the first text-based adventure game, some not so predetermined. And this would propel your character forward in the game until you reach the end of the game. But why text? Well, text was really the only game mechanic available to game makers at the time. At the first adventure game, Adventurer, or now known as Colossal Cave, uh, gaming, uh, many of the first computers didn't have monitors or even keyboards as standards. Um, The code was basic, and you had to hook up to uh, a mainframe in order to play the game. Eventually, Colossal Cave will, will come to the home PC gaming market, but we're dealing with computers of the home PC era, if we're, we're going to center around there, in which, you know, keyboards and monitors were very rudimentary compared to today's standards. Uh, the most important restriction on the home PC was memory and computational power. Uh, many of the computers had less than five megabyte drives. Memory and CPU power were, were dealing with bytes. Bytes. Uh, monitors were CERT and were anywhere from 7 inch to 13 inches in size. So there was no like real sound with these computers. No sweet graphics. No color. Or the ability to even point and click because the mouse had not even even invented yet. And fundamentally, what these computers did was just text and calculations for business. And that was by design. Even though PC home market was opening up with um, the Xerox Alto and eventually, you know, the Apple II, they still had a kind of a 
business component built it within the PC space. It wasn't they were not initially designed for, you know, game making. So text was really the only means of creating these games. And that's why you have text as the main component for the for the game mechanics. This game mechanic in which the game players had to make their decision to play using inference to figure out what the next step in order to move forward in the game. The clues given in the narrative script written by the game makers were word choices on the part of the game makers to get the players to make a choice response slash command. The style play using words will eventually create almost worlds for players to engage in and it allowed for the players because it was a narrative script format, a novel format, if you will, a book reading esque style of gaming for players to use their own imagination to fill in the worlds. But a game built on wordplay has its drawbacks as well. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But I just wanted to speak about like what the players had to have in order to play the game. Besides just having a home PC, which at the time, or having a strong affiliation with either a university or a business system hooked up to mainframes, but just speaking about the PC system, you know, the, the Xerox Star in 1981 cost $16,500. That's, you know, some places that's a car, a down payment for a house. Today's dollars, that's definitely a house price. Of forty-six thousand um, dollars, the Apple II, which came out in nineteen seventy-seven, was around thirteen hundred dollars, and is now like five thousand, you know, five hundred dollars in today's dollars. You know, you had to have the skill set and interest of and the means to to own one of these computers, and because of that, uh, many of the games centered around you know engineers and then eventually branched out because of the game mechanics of the game of being based on text these games were not sold necessarily with computer stores all the time but in bookstore to get that book you know reader that book lover crowd and, and because of you know the engineer base and then the means of most people either having had already had the skill set of knowing how to operate a computer, you know, it's the, the game centered around science fiction, fantasy, role playing, and puzzles. And so you had to have either essentially in the beginning of playing these games problem solving skills, or you had to have the ability or the desire to develop the problem solving skills in order to play the games. So let's talk about the first text based adventure game, which was called. Adventure. Uh, later retitled Colossal Cave, which is actually a real place in the world. And it came out in 1975. So it was initially a mainframe game and then eventually was ported over to the PC market. It was created by Will Crower Cawther to entertain his children and was based on his passion of caving. The game had players explore an imaginary cave system and gather stuff. Uh, the first five level uh, just had five levels, one hidden, one more kind of a side quest, and using just a simple two words to move your player about the game. Two words, just two words. It also had a magic power word, which would become part of a trope of the um, text-based gaming system. It was X Y Z Z Y. It also had you know wordplay because again we're we're dealing with texts and games that would eventually be based off of novels um, called Wit's End, which is like, you can say, the final room of the final level. In order to solve the game, you had to use a word that you had never used before called Blast or Detonate to end the game. And these were the type of commands you had to do. You had to use Look, uh, Unlock, Throw Axe, um, fill bottle, blast again, um, go out, go south, unlock, go down, go west, take the cage, drop the rod, head back. Just very simple, basic commands. 
And the narrative structure or the narrative clue that you had to base your commands started like this with the game. So you're greeted with a the opening initial sequence of the game where it says, Welcome to Adventure, would you like instructions? Somewhere nearby is a colossal cave where others have found fortunes and treasure and gold. Though it's rumored that some who enter are never seen again. Magic is said to work in the cave. I will be your eyes and hands. Direct me with the commands of one or two words. I should warn you that I look only at the first five letters of each word. So you have to enter northeast as N-E, distinguish it from north. Should you get stuck, type help for some general hints. For more information how to end your adventure, etc., type info. And the gameplay begins with at the end of the road. You're standing at the end of the road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building and down a gully. And this is where you begin to decide what do you do. Do you go to the forest or do you enter the building? Decisions, decisions, decisions. From the very beginning of this game and pretty much every game that will come after, what you choose to do with your character will make the determination of your play. So if you go to the forest, if you're going into the buildings, things will go one way. If you go into the building first, then things will go completely different from going to the forest first time around. And let's not talk about the dwarf. And pretty much from this initial first adventure game, this is where problem solving skills come in, uh, understanding or trying to understand the game makers thinking in the narrative text to base your decisions. And this is where some of the problems when it comes to the game mechanics of text-based games have had. And it's it's, it's called like a, a verb noun parsing or word verbiage, if you will. It's summarized in guess the syntax or guess the verb. For example, for one particular game, you couldn't say get ye flask. When people talk about text adventure games, that's an example they bring up. Or the, the fact that you couldn't use a particular command to turn off uh, a lamp. Um, some people would, to do that would, would go like, put water on, drop water on, pour water on, different types of things. And the, the appropriate uh, syntax, if you will, was extinguish, which wouldn't be something that people necessarily would think right off the bat. And because of this, it could lead to weird interpretations of language, uh, not a clear enough direction or command on the part of the game makers. Um, what you thought you could do, the game makers didn't allow or did not conceive as an optional play. And of course, there's like puzzles or puns that didn't make sense to everyone, uh, but made the game's more engaging for those who could solve it. And so, you know, as these games progress, you know, and became more developed and the space grew, you had games that would come with like world maps. So you have an understanding of where it is you're supposed to go in the game. Um, a list of commands that can be used in the game, whether it be a, a game book or within the game itself would be the list of commands that you can use. Um, and later as text games became more popular, you start getting backstories, commemorative items, pictures, etc. The various uh, trappings and special we get with special edition games first were developed with these text-based adventure games. And the tropes that are part of games um, now come from these early, you know, text-based adventure games. You know, gathering of objects, uh, basic parts of games since forever. If you think about it, Monopoly, it's a gathering of, you know, houses and uh, money. Those are the objects you have to gather in order to win. And taking objects and forming something else is also something that comes from text-based adventure games. Puzzles and games. So puzzles were one of the key components of these games. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy an often cruel game where the where relishes in the death of a player is uh, known for its uh, difficult puzzles. Zork One had a, a maze in it that proved to be some somewhat difficult and somewhat fun, depending on your your skill level. Interactive objects, you know, riddles, mini games, and for the records, riddles suck. So Satoshi's Hunt, Satoshi's Treasure Hunt, has many of these basic elements that come from the text-based adventure games. It has a mini hunt. It has puzzles. It has clues in the narrative scope where you have to guess the kind of syntax and verbiage of the the game makers in order to determine your next decision play. It even has the gathering of objects, if you will. For example, the uh, the hunted key was a task that you had to perform in which you had to gather an object in order to 
uh, present it to the hunter in order to obtain another object. In this case, the key. But here's some more examples of how text-based adventure games have influenced the, the underpinnings of the Satoshi's treasure hunt. So for example, if we actually look at the main site of Satoshi's treasure, there, there are no graphics, there's no audio cues. For example, if we look at the main Satoshi treasure hunts website, you can see by its design, it's, it's very minimalistic. It's very basic. Uh, and it actually looks like the load screen for some of the early text adventure games. There are no, you know, graphics, there are no pictures, there's no audio. Uh, it's, it's very much designed in a similar fashion of something that uh, you would see from a text adventure game. Uh, the outline that uses um, ASIC, uh, the, the, even the font looks very similar to uh, early text adventure games. So if we look at the hunted key, and we click on it, you know, um, the coloring, if, if it wasn't for my set settings, would either be green, or in this case, uh, using this particular setting, is white, the actual looking of the site itself. Now, everything's crossed out because this key has, um, as is stated here on the bottom, the clue has been retired, the hunting key has been found, and the additional keys with Agent 2 and Agent 3 have been returned to the vault. And if you actually click on Agent 2, you see the bulletin. And here you have to, in fact, recover Burning Chrome, an object, uh, which is this book by William Gibson. So already, you know, the, the game makers are utilizing a style of conveying their information to the audience, to us, the game players, in, in this text adventure style where everything is text-based here. There's no, no direct audio clips from the game makers. Uh, there's no graphics, there's no video play. There's, you know, yes, there's point and click because, you know, the mouse has been invented, but it's very much in that vein, that very much in this, in that style. You have to find the, you know, use your skill set, your, your problem uh, thinking skills to in order to find this particular field agent and you have to gather an object in order to solve this particular puzzle because it is in a set in essence you're taking an object that, ga that allows you to obtain another object in this case uh, the retired key of field agent 2 and uh, you you know by taking that object, you're in essence making another object that particular key. Uh, if you look at the Obon keys um, place here, you literally had to gather puzzle pieces in order to make a puzzle. And from this puzzle, you have to, in essence, piece together with your problem solving skills the the solution now this is very basic again there's no video overlays there's no graphics there's um you know no mass shootings or anything like that it's very like you had to solve from the clues of the from the game makers narrative here there and you had to use some inference you had to clue you know use their inference here from the narrative look at their verbiage if you will their syntax to order to see the clue that you, to go to the next step so you were given some information about the numbers here let's blow this up a little bit of 762 BAC 1D defined and from looking at the narrative of clues that I have here, 
your puzzle take you take the puzzle pieces and you spend a few more minutes listening to the bird song it chirps and it tweets so this this clue gives you a look at your twitter and the fact that you're you're looking for this number here and the other numbers via twitter and you had to somehow using your problem solving skills be able to obtain the puzzle pieces here from Twitter, piece them together, you know, piece the objects together to form another object, and then from this object you're supposed to find the clues that gives you the the website handle and the uh, another another clue was you had to download some music via Twitter and using a special program we're able to find the QR code inside a piece of a piece of music so you had to solve for the puzzle uh, it gives you the, a clue uh, in this case the QR code and I've since learned and um, as part of the solution you had to basically uh, take this QR code and place it in a uh, picture program, either Photoshop or Paint, and then you had to kind of uh, fill in the space where the QR code is to fill it in so that way you can scan it, because you cannot directly scan it through this, this spectrum here. And again, it's just, you know, you had to, again, problem solving skills uh, for this particular puzzle. And this would lead you to, um, the website, the QR code, at the far end of the, the MP3 file, you had the passphrase, you enter the passphrase, you obtain the key. Or wait, no, you obtain another clue <laughs> that gives you this puzzle. And we're, this is, yeah, that's the earth key. It's been a few keys, it's been a, been a late one here, I'm trying to finish this up and it gives you this and you're supposed to use your problem solving skills again <laughs> to figure this out uh people are really stuck on this one you have these characters here people are pursuing this image on the bottom uh, looks like a rabbit a pig and then trying to somehow break through this chaotic field here to order to solve for Solve this puzzle in order to change the uh, the URL and get the the passphrase. But again, this all goes down to the kind of the narrative structure here of the the text-based games, where you're given like a story format uh, of all these various clues. Even the keys have a bit of a of a, a narrative touch. So, but for key nine at the, the end of the puzzle when you um, enter the passphrase and you get the key you have this kind of these little narrative quir quirks if you will um, which I wonder as time goes on if they will also eventually lead to another key and is the uh, a lyric from New World Order not New it's a New World New Order Yes, yeah, New Order, and it's the song Blue Monday. So in essence, what I want to get at is that we can look to the past to help us um, move forward with the game. Uh, already, there has been a mini hunt uh, that took place in New York. Uh, again, a lot of these, these uh, keys to obtain them, these clues that we have, uh, have a bit of a narrative structure to them. Uh, they are puzzles, so you have to solve the puzzles. And in, in many cases, you you had to solve one puzzle to order to obtain the particular object, if you will, from that puzzle in order to go to the next URL and then solve that particular puzzle. Then from that puzzle, you were able to get the final URL, and then you had to use uh, the previous clues to figure out the passphrase. And again, it's about gathering the objects, gathering the right objects, uh, with some puzzles, looking at them and seeing, for example, the Aesop story, the Aesop key, uh, realizing that 
from the structure of the key itself that your the emphasis is on the border that is a code and again some people recognize um, the code um, cipher if you will from uh, New Order uh, the particular I can't remember the gentleman's name that created the code and from there they were able to solve the initial phrase in the middle and then we're able to go around and find the the appropriate uh, G, uh, appropriate clue from here, which was a Gmail account. Then you email the Gmail account, came back with the fail, and from within that email, you had to really kind of read and parse out the rest of the clue. They give you the URL, the final URL, and the passphrase. And so, again, it's just like step by step, all these different types of. Uh, puzzle skills that you have to, to utilize problem solving and inference and why I bring up this particular key is that you could have gone the wrong down the wrong rabbit hole some people emphasize the entire photograph and looked at these words here to see in these numbers to see if they were in any shape or form associated uh, with the clue and into finding the key and it turns out that was not the case it was always about the border, the borderline, if you will, and figuring out the uh, code. And that, again, kind of goes back to the different types of decisions where you can go down the wrong path and then you have to come back to the beginning and kind of, in essence, start over again. So that's it for this episode. This is my best explanation of, of explaining what a text adventure game is and its and its influences on the Satoshi's treasure hunt. I hope that uh, my explanation helps kind of clarify the nature of this style, if you will, the, the game mechanics of this particular hunt that allow you to kind of see the game with some fresh eyes. Uh, I have a link, a bunch of links in the show notes to all my reference points and videos I use to do some research. I am thinking of maybe... Um, picking up a couple of these games that I played as part of the research for this particular project, maybe doing a Twitch stream of me going through these games. I'm telling you right now, I did use a lot of walkthroughs when I was playing them, but I might pick up a couple of the newer ones and try to try to figure it out. Uh, if you want to watch me fail a bunch of times, partic particularly with Hitchhiker's Guide, I like, I died a lot. I, I, I died so horribly and so often on that game um, but maybe you might have some fun or amusement uh, <laughs> watching me die a lot so again this is Hiroshi Shai you've been watching Satoshi Treasure Hunters and uh, on with the hunt <laughs>